The dawn of the world isn't what we thought, and in retrospect, it seems almost painfully obvious, especially since Etra Oda has laid out the secrets of this planet across three separate arcs now, including Wano, Water 7, and surprisingly, Long Ring Long Land, which contains one of the biggest hidden in plain sight spoilers for the end of One Piece that so very few people notice, because if you look over there, there's an annoying fox commanding your attention. But the overall proposal of this theory is that we've been thinking about the dawn of the world in far too metaphorical of a manner. Dawn being used to describe an intangible action of joy and harmony brought to the planet simultaneously, world peace, etc. Freedom and happiness, the stuff like that. And sure, that's all gonna be part of it, but this theory suggests that the dawn of the world is going to be quite literal. Because with the revelation that One Piece planet was subject to a great flood, we now know that over 90% of the world, potentially even closer to 99%, is currently submerged deep in the darkness of the ocean. And when it comes to water, big water, there are some locations which have access to light, notably Fishman Island, but that's explained as filtered light that reaches the seafloor via the roots of the Sunlight Tree Eve, a lovely piece of megaflora that we still have yet to fully gaze upon. But as we see when the Straw Hats dive down to get to Fishman Island, the vast majority of this planet sits in pitch black, the kind of darkness that not even Frankie's nipple lights could ever hope to illuminate. This level of the planet is referred to as the Underworld. Ooh, spooky and it has been left deliberately unexplored by Oda. And that's because it holds all of the secrets to the long lost civilizations of this planet. So when we discuss the dawn of the world, what we could be referring to is a literal dawn, where sunlight manages to reach these areas of the planet for the first time in a millennia. Right now, 99% of this world is asleep. It's just chilling there in the dark, waiting to be discovered. So here's how, why, and a bunch of other question words answered. Before we move on, I want to say that the foundation of this video comes from another video by Mr. Morge. There'll be a link to it in the description, give it a watch, because he is incredibly on point. And my only criticism is that I think he's even more right than he realized at the time, which is what we're gonna get into here. As we recently learned, the One Piece world we see today is but the remnant of a significantly larger and much more grand planet that was subject to an apocalyptic flood. So in regards to great flood ideas, many people are quick to point their fingers at that their Christianity for inspiration, particularly because of the Noah, and there's a lot of other biblical elements in One Piece like Bartholomew Kuma carrying his Bible. So I think it's a fair connection to make, and it may speak to Emu's motivation to have caused the Great Flood in the first place. In the Bible, it states, So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. I don't think that's quite on point though, because the Flood myth, it exists in so many religions and ever so many more mythological texts. However, the one that strikes me the most is actually from the Epic of Gilgamesh, aka the very first book ever written where the highest god Enlil decides to destroy the world with a flood because humans have become, quote, too noisy. It has nothing to do with the wickedness or regret over what humanity is. It's just because those humans, mate, they're pretty annoying, which lines up pretty perfectly because that's usually the reason given for the cruelty of the world nobles who refer to themselves as gods. For example, Bartholomew Kuma's father was killed for the crime of being too noisy and mildly annoying. As mundane as it may be, that's where I think the motivation for this great flood came from. The fact that Emu simply found humans irritating, I mean, look at them, and then decided to purge them as best he could. Emu's design is of course based on the Umibozu, meaning sea priest, a creature that demands an offering from ships or it will sink them, much like how Emu and the world government demand a tribute from the islands in the One Piece world or he will destroy them. And while countless theories exist to explain what Emu looks like unsilhouetted, many of which electing to give him slash her some pretty enormous capital, capital knockers. knockers, because why not? But my favorite theory for Emu is that he's not silhouetted at all. This is just what he looks like because he's an Umibozu. But this whole flood twist was pretty blatantly hinted at with the introduction of the world nobles themselves. When they were first introduced, everyone jumped to the idea of astronauts. And that's fair because aliens do exist in One Piece. We've met a lot of them and the world nobles may very well have heritage that comes from other planets or moons. But I think the Occam's razor is now firmly slicing the world nobles attire as a reference to diving suits. If the sea levels rose about 200 meters in the span of a century, then I imagine that people would be perpetually terrified of being caught in a flood 
flood, and they may have preemptively decided to engineer these diving suits in the event of sudden unpredictable water levels. Again, this happened over the course of a century. So during the void century, you've now got multiple generations of what would become the world nobles growing up and not knowing what life was like without these diving suits. So by the time everyone packed up and moved to Marajoie, we were at least three generations in and everyone had forgotten the original purpose of the suits, instead claiming that they were designed so they didn't have to breathe the air of the masses, which is a cultural identity that has prevailed to this very day. But how did Emu cause the flood? Well, it's probably one of two things. Either through repeated use of the ancient weapons, at least one of which is confirmed to have a knock-on effect of raising sea levels, albeit slowly, or we could do it all in one go by building the Red Line. It's been speculated for decades now that the Red Line is an artificial continent, and building such a massive structure would displace the world's oceans and lead to most of it becoming submerged. Or both, it could be both. But Oda has never really showed us the true depths of these waters outside of Fishman Island. So as much as we've explored of this world, we still know startlingly little. Which is why the Jinbei cover story stands out. Because he actually goes on a journey through the sea in parts of the world that aren't Fishman Island, and along the way he discovers underwater ruins that are currently being used as a makeshift home for sea beasts. But unlike the Fishman Island infrastructure, they were not built for this purpose. They are the remains of an old and likely long lost civilization that became victims of the Great Flood. And the point Mr. Morge brings up that I really like is the idea of adventure lost. Both Roger and Luffy set out to have the best adventure possible, and at the end of his journey, Roger realized that as much as he'd seen and done, there was still so much left to discover. And that's why he said he would have loved to have lived in Joy Boy's time, so that he could adventure through that 99% of the planet that is completely cut off to him in the modern day. And then when he's about to get executed, he says, my treasure, why it's right there. It's right where I and everyone else left it. This whole world, it is in One Piece. It's long been speculated that the One Piece is the planet itself just without the red line, therefore connecting all of the world's oceans and creating the old blue, etc. However, this new idea is much more land focused. We're still connecting the world, but the idea is to make a lot of the ocean disappear, to drain it somehow, in order to reveal the ancient world and connect the One Piece that way, by reuniting all of these separate islands as one big continent, or continents plural. And in retrospect, so many arcs in One Piece directly tackle the theme of global isolation and a desire for connectivity. In his video, Mr. Morge speaks a lot about Wano, which I think is one of the better examples of this idea. However, in that video, I think he overlooked a very important arc, which is Long Ring Longland. When making theories, I think a lot of people just sort of skip this arc because they consider it one big gag, and there cannot be anything important in it apart from Kuzan at the end. He's, he's pretty cool. But Long Ring Longland has everything. Oda laid out the concept for the entire One Piece world and its future right here, this early on in the series. Usually, Long Ring Longland is 10 separate islands in a ring shape separated by water. However, in reality, it is a single island where the vast majority of the landmass is covered in water, with the exception of once a year, where the low tide reveals this hidden land for a couple of hours and allows free travel across the entire island. This is a microcosm of the One Piece world in general. We have a series of teeny tiny islands penetrating the sea, all inaccessible to one another, whilst in reality, they are all connected by this vast land that exists underwater. And what the people of Long Ring Longland are waiting for is their equivalent of the dawn of the world. That one day a year where they receive the freedom to travel between the islands on foot, which very much plays into Luffy's personal idea of freedom. One of the main reasons why Luffy is a pirate is because any individual island is far too small and too stuffy for him. And even the most fun ones eventually become like a prison for him. And we'll get into this idea in a bit, but surely maximum freedom would mean being able to go wherever you want by foot. The idea that Luffy could travel the entire entire world without needing a navigator to get him across the dangerous waters. Back to Long Ring Longland specifically, there's also a surprisingly touching story between Tom Jit and his horse, Shelly. For 10 years, everyone else in the village left the island to continue migrating. However, Shelly remained behind and waited for Tom Jit, who was stuck on bamboo stilts for 10 years that continued growing far, far into the sky, thus making Tom Jit and the sun best friends, or at least housemates. Luffy even said that the stilts were so tall that he couldn't see the top. And what I'm getting at here is that Tonjit is the world's worst joy boy metaphor. Long ago, he vanished from Long Ring Long Land. No one knew where he went, but Shelly decided to wait for his return. We even get a montage going through the seasons of this poor, poor horse alone in the rain and the snow and the such and going through all of the misery. It is that the world at large is currently experiencing in the absence of joy boy, but very importantly, Shelly never lost hope. Shelly knew that Tonjit would return one day, just as the world knows that joy boy will return one day 
and that Tonja did. So Shelley's own personal sun god fell from his bamboo stilts in the sky and reignited joy within her. And while they're riding, Shelley even starts singing. And Tonjit makes a promise to her that they will cross the sea together and do all sorts of freedom related things. And Tonjit himself is a complete goofball on a scale that can even outdo Luffy. Like when he couldn't find his 10 year old milk. The only thing he could find was this mysterious cheese that just appeared out of nowhere. Tonjit always makes me smile and that is the key quality of a joy boy. And I don't mean this as a joke. I think that what Oda has done throughout many arcs in One Piece is beta test his idea for the world at large. But also I do mean it as a joke because in the end Oda's mission is to make us smile. The most ridiculous thing you can think of can and will be possible. But the more recent and more obvious example of a global microcosm is of course Wano. Of every island in One Piece, Wano is absolutely the craziest, if only because it's a fusion of every major island climate type that you can encounter in the Grand Line. And it even has these huge artificial walls built around it, which reflects the potentially artificial nature of the Red Line, which we'll touch on later because that becomes a little very important. Unlike Long Ring Long Land, these areas of Wano aren't separated. And that's because Wano itself is meant to represent a different idea. Because much like the grander world, Wano was commandeered by these bad evil ruler people, Kaido, the man with actual power like Imu, and Kurizumi Orochi, a beneficiary of said power like the world nobles. With Kaido's ultimate plan being to do a purge of Wano by dropping an island on the capital, and many of Wano's residents waiting and praying for a day in the future where Kaido's defeat occurs and a new dawn graces Wano, as predicted by the prophecy of Kozuki Toki. Like the moon, you are ignorant of the dawn. If there is one ardent wish that must be fulfilled, it will be when nine shadows are cast, woven together through 20 years of moonlit nights. Only then shall you understand the radiance of dawn. So Wano was waiting for its own equivalent of Joy Boy. And while I guess Joy Boy did literally rock up in the form of Luffy, the person Wano was actually waiting for was Kozuki Momonosuke, who like Joy Boy disappeared long ago and then reappeared to save Wano and bring about a new dawn for the country. One Piece is full of Joy Boys and Joy Girls. In fact, pretty much every island in dire need has had their own specific Joy person, a Joy person that wasn't a member of the Straw Hats. With Alabaster, that was Princess Vivi. Yes, Luffy and the Straw Hats were responsible for defeating that nasty, nasty crocodile, but Vivi was the heart of the country. It was her who recruited the Straw Hats to save Alabaster from tyranny, and it was her that ultimately stopped the war. And for another example, Andres Rosa, there are multiple Joy folk in the Riku dynasty, and this one is especially potent because Doflamingo, a former world noble, commandeered the island and made everyone believe that the Riku family were evil demons, much like the world nobles do with those who possess the will of D. Every island has its own personal arc savior, their own mini joy people. But the greater world and continent that those islands are a part of have a much grander savior in Luffy. Moving to Water 7, this island is in a very unique position because it makes commentary on the real issue of scarce resources and paints a picture of a very bad end for the entire planet. Water 7 is of course a very unfortunate island because there is no actual land left. All of Water 7 is a man-made structure. It is buildings built on other buildings. They don't have natural land to do things like plant trees to produce wood and such, which is difficult because their main industry is shipbuilding, which in Tom's day led to a dystopian outcome where the shipwrights were fighting amongst themselves for survival because the island was so isolated and resources were so scarce. And Tom's solution to that problem was the sea train. He was going to bring a new dawn to Water 7 by connecting it to other islands in order to assist with trade and give everyone the freedom to cross the ocean. After the sea train is completed, the narrator says, in this city suffocating in isolation, the people got aboard and the sea train puffing Tom crossed the ocean. Suffocating is a very important word there. It's a word that comes up every now and then in One Piece because it's very specific language that Oda likes to use in key situations. The immediate example that comes to mind is Andres Rosa, where Luffy stated that Doflamingo's actions were suffocating him and that he was going to kick his flamingo butt in order to be free again. That's what's happening all over the world. Individual islands on this planet are suffocating and none of them can reach their full potential of freedom without help from the others, which makes narrative sense given that these islands are all fragments of the same concept continent, or again continents plural, so they are all very much small pieces of one bigger puzzle that cannot be formed without one another. It's crazy, but Oda has been hitting us over the head with this idea for decades, and it's only just now really starting to take tangible.
tangible form. To Luffy, the world as it is is suffocating, and if his desire is to have as much freedom as possible, then we need to drain this ocean. We need to connect every island on this planet in one piece, so that Luffy can go anywhere he wants whenever he wants to. Now, one way of doing this, which is easier said than done, would be to get rid of the red line, after which point the world's oceans would naturally return to their original levels. Mr. Mort suggested that this could be the result of Emu's power. If he was to create the red line with some sort of ability, then defeating Emu, much like defeating other Devil Fruit users, could lead to the immediate disappearance of the red line. I don't know if it's that simple though, but what I do know is that this would be such a brilliant ending to One Piece, because Luffy's journey would continue. We've spent a quarter of a century exploring less than 1% of this world, and so when the dawn of the world comes about and sunlight touches this lost 99%, if I were Luffy, my immediate desire would be to explore. And that's the end. Luffy goes off on his never-ending journey and achieves the maximum amount of freedom that he has been fighting for this entire time. And for us as readers and watchers, even though the story is over, the world of One Piece still remains every bit as magical and mysterious as it was at the very beginning, because there's no telling what sort of strange and amazing things this planet still has hidden from us.